Sir Martin Sorrell, talk about a storied career. Education at Cambridge and Harvard, joined Saatchi and Saatchi, the advertising company, when he was about 30 years old, and then led their acquisitions and refined the concept of the earnout. In 1985, you bought an interest in a company called Wire and Plastic Products that made wire shopping baskets. And the next three years acquired 18 companies in the advertising business, completely changing the business model and changing the name to WPP. The acquisitions included two large hostile ones in J. Walter Thompson and Ogilvy and Mather. More acquisitions followed. By 2017, you were the longest serving CEO on the FTSE 100. And in 2018, you left WPP to start S4 Capital and promptly began acquiring again. You were knighted in 2000. In 2007, received Harvard's highest honor, the Alumni Achievement Honor. You're a governor of the London Business School and on the advisory boards for the Judge Business School in the UK and IESE of Spain. And I just skimmed the surface. So in my feeble attempt at British understatement, that's not a bad career at all, Sir Martin. Anything you want to have to say for yourself about all that? No, no, no you, you, you said it all, David. I mean, you, you, you should be in advertising. That's what I think. <laughs> well, uh, you've earned it all of this. It doesn't match your storied career at Honeywell. That, and, well, you're and before uh, you're, 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 you're very kind, but uh, nobody's given me a knighthood either for anything I've done. So. Uh, but I remember one thing, you know, you, you were at TRW. And I think when I was at B school at 66 to 8, I think TRW started the T groups. These were these 360 degree evaluation groups that met. And you basically, there were some great case studies. And I'm sure it was TRW Systems. <laughs> there was a case study about T groups, which were HBO, human behavior organization groups where people evaluated one another and whether you were the top boss or the top dog or or lower down the pecking order you met in a room and you told everybody what you thought of one another and I remember that it was so violent when you did this that in, in fact in the case study a couple of people committed suicide because it was what? so yes it was so virulent and so so aggressive so when i saw trw is looking back at your your history <laughs> I just immediately t groups came in. <laughs> well it's funny because when you first started that conversation i thought to myself wow that sounds like a horrible idea <laughs> and i've got um we could have a long conversation about my experience at trw at some point <laughs> So uh, to focus on what the audience wants to hear from, which is you, let's say um, as a British CEO, you have followed Brexit more closely than any of us. And I believe you were more interested in staying than leaving. It right. appears we are in the final throes of resolution, including a discussion about a big meeting Sunday where maybe there'll be a conclusion. So. What happens? Does any of this get resolved? Will the UK economy suffer shorter long term? Will the aggressive deficit spending once contemplated by the UK to facilitate the transition happen? And if it does, will it be helpful? And enlighten us on Brexit, please, from someone who knows. Well, I, I'm, I'm dreadfully depressed at the moment, David. I'm, I Really, I mean, in all seriousness, I'm really depressed because uh, the electorate, in their wisdom, and uh, something we have to abide by uh, democratically, four years ago it was, made the decision for us to come out. Uh, you know, I would, I would preface this by calling, if I was going to give this a sort of copy line, I would call it Eaton Mess. You know what Eaton Mess is? It's that, it's that uh, dessert that you get, which is meringue mixed with, I think, blackcurrant. And it's called Eaton Mess because I think it originated from Eaton. But of course... Prime Minister Cameron and Prime Minister Johnson, where did they go to school? They went to Eton. So I call this the Eton mess. <laughs> and if, if you and I had been running a company and four years ago, we'd made the decision to do something and four years on, we were still trying to implement it. Well, we would have been long gone. The shareholders would have got rid of us in, in quick order. The, the, the short answer to your question is that by this weekend, I think, we will know whether we have a deal, 
which, by the way, is such a skinny deal in terms of its implications that, you know, uh, my son, uh, one of my sons works, uh, well, all three work in the financial community. So, uh, I was asking them and they came back to me and said, well, look, is there any difference between no deal or a deal, really, given that what we're going to get from the EU, even if we agree something on Sunday night, is going to be so skinny that it doesn't make any difference. But I think psychologically, it does make a huge difference. And, you know, I'm, I was very much of the view at the beginning of this week and the last few months that we would have a deal done. It now looks, quite frankly, and I'm anticipating what happens by Sunday, I, my, my bet now would be that there will be no deal. Both uh, Ursula van der Leyen and uh, Boris Johnson have both said that they think the most probable thing is no deal. And I, I don't know how the negotiators are continuing to negotiate when your boss is saying, look, there probably will be, or your bosses are saying, basically, it probably won't be a deal. So I, I think it's a disaster. Mm. Um, I, now, I was a Remainer, but you know, I, I saw the opportunity once we came out as what I would call Singapore on steroids or Singapore on Thames. In other words, we copied what Singapore did on a much smaller scale when they broke away from Malaysia. You know, if you go back to when Lee Kuan Yew took Singapore out of the Malaysian alliance, they said it would never work. It would never happen. And look, we all know what has happened in the case of Singapore, much smaller. Mm. Now, five million people, but then it was much, much. So I saw that, you know, investment in reskilling, investment in re education, investment in hardware, ports and roads, etc., investments in software, 5G, and everything. Reskilling the population that have, you know, been, have been turned over by globalization, by digitization, digital transformation. Now we have a situation where ravaged by COVID, if we don't have a deal, I, I think the implications are huge. And the answer to your question, if if the UK economy was going to go up, you know, up to the right a little bit, let's sort of alter the the angle of ascent. But if it was mm -hmm. going to go up before it it will now be well below that as a result of coming out of Europe. COVID obviously hasn't helped, although there will be bounce back next year. I'm very bullish on the global economy next year, yeah. driven by vaccines, driven by the bounce back from the minus five this year, probably to, my, to plus five to six next year. China, I think, is on steroids. They have seven vaccines. <laughs> um, they have, you know, golden week. They're, they're back to normal domestically, yeah. not internationally domestically. When you look at production in October, up 28%. I mean, we are looking at a China, I think, that will emerge from COVID in a far stronger position and stronger relative position. But Britain, I'm afraid, I, I, I am quite gloomy about the short to medium term. And I think it will be five to ten years before we 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 go we, we we're above where we would have been if we had stayed in Europe. There will be a sharp dip uh, in GDP and a sharp dip in our economic well-being. And to your question, with COVID on top of it, whilst I'm bullish about twenty-one five to six percent GDP growth globally, and I'm bullish about twenty-two. Maybe, maybe around four to four and a half percent, which, as you well know, is a higher level than we've seen in yeah. many years, particularly in a non inflationary world in nominal GDP growth. I really worry about what happens in 23 and after. And in the case of the UK, how we fund this increase in government debt that we've taken on as a result of COVID plus the strains on the economy from Brexit, I think will increasingly marginalise us for a number of years. Now, it was, we're very resourceful. It's a great, intelligent uh, population, 60 million people who are you know, mercantilists, not as good as the Germans on exports, I would say. <laughs> and the pattern has to shift from Europe to North and Middle East and Africa, 
net net, it, it's not a good position. Now, I'm, yeah, on Sunday, we may have Boris and Ursula saying we'll carry on negotiating. We'll see. But it, the, 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 the mood music at the moment, David, is very, very negative. I mean, oh, there's a lot of posturing in these negotiations, particularly at last minute. But I, I am very negative about the prospects. Well, posturing was the word I was going to use also, is that uh, they're both doing a good job of positioning themselves publicly so that if it does fail, they've already conditioned everything. Yes. That being said, uh, it doesn't seem like there's a good reason for either side really to end up agreeing to anything. I think there's a very good chance there's nothing that comes out of this meeting, even though they're trying to set it up as conclusive. Uh, there's a, num a number of uh, other topics I know people are going to want uh, to hear about you, uh, hear from you about. Um, so I'd say the second one was uh, you've had a obviously very successful career and front row seat to the advertising industry. And it's obviously changed significantly with digital technology. Right. So what are the trends that audience members should pay attention to beyond just more digital? What and, and what new companies do you find interesting within those trends and why? Well, I, I think, David, the, you, you have to look at it. I don't think anything new has come out. Well, I'm sure there must be something new. But from what I see, very little new has come out of COVID-19. What, what we've seen is a massive acceleration of digital transformation and implementation. And... In a way, COVID, you know, it's difficult to talk about something which has killed 1.6 million people so far around the world, and probably the statistics underplay that. So it's been, a, you know, it's as close as you can get to a war, a silent war as you possibly can get. But having said that, those companies that were slow to change, who, you know, and you know this well, after 2010, we were faced with a world that was growing in nominal terms at two, three or four percent. Very little inflation, very little pricing power. And if you ran a company go and cut your costs a bit, but stop, your EPS was up by naught to five percent or five to ten percent, and you kept the shareholders and analysts at bay, if I can put it like that. They, you know, they weren't going up by eight hundred percent like you did at Honeywell, but, but, but you know, you were, they were doing okay. The average CEO lasted about five years or lasts about five years. Yeah. So it's a bit like a prime minister or a president. So you could jog along before COVID blew a hole in that. Q2, banks' earnings were down by 50%, holding companies were down by 50%. It was coming. And what we've seen... Uh, and I'm talking about from an S4 perspective, and there were two big wins that we had around BMW Mini was one, and Mondelez was the other in the last couple of months. But in both cases, you had change agents inside companies bringing change and agility at the time which was needed. I mean, I think agility is the key core attribute that is needed even before you know, Paul Pol talk about VUCA, volatility, uncertainty, and everything else, and we'll talk eloquently about it, and he was dead right, but COVID-19 proved it in spades that you have to be agile. So what, what I think has happened is you have to think about it at three levels. The hmm. first level is consumer level. So I'm a consumer like you, you, you or I. What have we been doing? We've been buying online. We've been educating our kids or our grandkids online. We've been we've been buying our healthcare online, our financial services online. We've been amusing ourselves with in-home entertainment. So the focus now that, that that has been accelerated by COVID. So one example: thirty percent of U.S. households have used online for the first time for groceries and essentials. So it's hmm. escalated, just like SARS in China. Before SARS in China, the Chinese consumer was moving online, but was not 
accelerated as they were, as much as they were by SARS. So the first is at consumer. The second is at the media level. Uh, the, the media, the traditional media, uh, are under huge pressure. Free-to-air television. You saw the numbers from Disney, right? So 2024 Disney Plus, I think the forecast was... 80 to 90 million subscriptions. They've now put it up to 230 million subscriptions. Hmm. So you've seen what Time Warner are doing with theatrical releases at the same time as online releases. This is all going to put huge pressure on traditional TV, be aware, and traditional, obviously, cinemas, IMAX or whatever it happens to be. So, so newspapers and magazines, Rupert Murdoch closed, I think it was over 100 titles in Australia and New Zealand. So again, additional newspapers and magazines, spelling trees, distributing print, which is economically not a very intelligent thing to do, uh, or from an environmental point of view, that goes, that gets under pressure too, and the digital areas become more important. And then finally, and most importantly, the enterprises that you ran and that you run, you're connected with, uh, and that we're connected with, are going to transform digitally at a far, far faster rate. So you get that the, the general drift is CEOs or CFOs or CMOs or CIOs or CTOs or chief sales officers are all saying, I, I want to implement my 2024 plan in 2021. So I think you're seeing huge escalation. Now, to your question about where do I think of the great opportunities? Well, clearly COVID-19 puts healthcare and anything related to healthcare way up the agenda. Whether it's you know directly to avoid another pandemic caused naturally in inverted commas or caused by terrorism or whatever it is, that is gonna be front and center really important. So anything to do with the healthcare, Anything to do with financial services, again, online financial services. So I'll give you an example. We've recently been hired by Robin Hood to work on, you know, what do I see on the wires? Goldman potentially uh, IPOing them next year at 20 billion. So the fintech platforms become hugely important. In-home game and entertainment. Um, a, a, a company called Epic, which owns the Fortnite gaming, you know, which Tencent has a shareholding, have a technology, a production technology, which we're using in India very aggressively, which means that we can produce content, advertising content, in a studio in New Delhi, and we can set the, that piece of digital commercial tape or production in any place in the world. We do not have to move from the studio. We can reproduce the, the, the location in the studio using their technology. And I'll give you another little example in relation to Epic. So we were looking at, at clever ways. This was in the New York Times a few, a few weeks ago. We were looking at clever ways to, in, in, you know, to, to connect with clients. And our people in New York were connecting with clients in the Fortnite game using the Fortnite technology. So they would have avatars in the game that would talk to one another <laughs> instead of like you and I talking to one another. So what I would say is, uh, it, it, in a way, it's not new because these trends were in place, but the there's a huge compression, huge compression at the consumer level, a media level, uh, and uh, at, at an enterprise level. The enterprise level one is going to be the most profound, I think. I, I, I think, and those companies that didn't move quick enough now have the opportunity if they put their minds to it, because, you know, they'll take the hit. They'll take the write-off, even if it's a non-cash write-off, to try and get the systems in uh, uh, very quickly. So I think that's, yeah, and then, you know, one other thing, the platforms, basically Google, Facebook, and Amazon, and you know, it's controversial because they're obviously getting a lot of regulatory pressure. Somebody asked me in a, a, a webinar just now, a question came in, what do I think the surprise of 21 will be? 
And I said the resilience of the platforms, those three plus Alibaba, Tencent, and maybe TikTok. We have to see where that ends up. But those six platforms dominate. Remember this, digital media is about $250 billion of spend. 165, 170, it's a little bit more than that, maybe 275. 165, 170 is at Google. 75, 80 is at Facebook. Amazon's about 15 to 20. TikTok has about seven. Alibaba and Tencent, we don't really know exactly where it is. But the, the point the point is that these digital platforms, you know, a Pinterest or a Twitter or a Snap, a Snap, if it has a good year this year, it might do two billion, two and a half billion. So the domination of those, which is what the regulators are, or even the Chinese regulators are worried about it uh, in a Chinese context, that dominance is huge. I don't think that will be broken. And even if you broke up Facebook into three or Amazon into three, as Scott Galloway, who's the, the professor at NYU Stern Business School, you know, he's been very, uh, very voluble on this. You know, we should break up uh, Amazon and AWS, etc. Even he admits if you take AWS out of Amazon, it'll be bigger than Amazon uh, is now in, in, in a few years' time. So, that's that, those are some of the things that we see. I find your uh, uh, comments on the gaming industry particularly interesting because I, I would have never. I, you know, we just tend to think of it as kids playing video games. And yeah. to your point on the technology there going in directions that we never thought of. And yeah. I've also ended up seeing that on the entertainment side of it. The first time I saw that they were going to start publicizing, watching people playing video games. I thought this is ridiculous. <laughs> this, this is never going anywhere. And then they had 20,000 people show up in arenas to watch others play video games. And I thought, Okay, this is so far beyond my ken that I have uh, no idea where any of this is going. So I think but your it, insights are particularly helpful here. It's really interesting you say that because Bobby Kotick, I remember, you know, who 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 owns a massive chunk of Activision Blizzard or whatever they call it. Um, he sold the regional franchises to esports, which is what you're describing in part. Uh, and I remember Bob Kraft, who owns the Patriots, bought the I think the New England or Northeastern rights, and Bobby was selling really nothing. Um, but I can't remember how much uh, Bob Kraft played, but it was a very astute purchase for the reason that you said that that millennials or the younger generations are really into this. I mean, there are all sorts of issues around uh, mental health and. Uh, couch potatoes as opposed to physical activity, but you're right. And and those of you who watch the Queen's Gambit, right, uh, and and the, the, the game of chess, I mean, it's really modern day chess when you really think about it. And there, there are lots of people that just sit there watching grandmasters, particularly in Russia, play chess. So no different. I'm not yeah. one of them. I tend to go outside and fish or hunt instead, which uh, I'm sure others take issue with. But well, I bet uh, we could. Do, I bet David, we could do some virtual fishing and some virtual hunting. <laughs> <laughs> well, someday I might get to an age where I have to do that. But for now, I'm <laughs> going to go out on the stream. Uh, so the next one, because I find uh, what you did particularly intriguing, is you took a wire products company. Yes. And completely transformed it with acquisitions in a totally unrelated field. Oh, yeah. And at a time, and I would say still a time, when acquisitions are considered a great way to lose money for companies. <laughs> so what do you do differently uh, to make acquisitions so successful? And why does it work for you when it doesn't work for so many others? Well, look, look the honest answer is, David, and I think there have been a lot of uh, academic studies which have said X percent whatever it is, of deals don't work. Now, it's what's really interesting is that the, the, the way that we built Wire and Plastic Products or WPP was on a very different model to S4 Capital. And everything we do in S4 Capital, we call mergers. And I'll come on to that in a second. Why? At WPP, when we started with nothing, and in our very first prospectus, 
we said our objective, our mission was to build a, an a multinational advertising and marketing services company. When you start with a wire basket company, you know, if you're going to do it in your own lifetime, you know, you know organic growth is slower. It's better than growth by acquisition, but it's slower. And if you want to do it before you die, you have to um, achieve that objective. You have to you know, acquire. We, we did things through the earn out method, usually five years. So it really involved a down payment, if you like, and then payments on future future profits. And that, that I think, was a good way to build a, a professional service-based company at that point in time. But the, the, the concept, that concept, which I call a market share concept, started in the 1950s with a man called Marion Harper at Interpublic Group. He was the first one who said, I'm going to have groups of agencies uh, that compete against one another and sometimes cooperate and work for clients, often for conflict. You know, if I, if I had Honeywell as a client, whoever the biggest competitor was to Honeywell, you would probably say to me, you can't work for. So the idea of the, it was a market share thing, rather like Unilever detergents or detergents, you know, you launch the new brand, you know it's going to cannibalize some of your existing brands, but you do it because you build market share. That concept doesn't work anymore. And the reason it doesn't work anymore, we think the ad holding company concept is past its sell by date. It's too vertical. It's too silo driven. And if you do things by earn out, you, you, in, you intuitively or inherently create more fragmentation. And what you have to do to service clients is to bring people together because the client wants you to provide the best people to work on their business and they don't care where they come from. We might care where they come from because we get articles written in newspapers or trade magazines or we win a piece of new business and our people are thrilled, etc. But it's too narrow. What we've done with S4 Capital, we have four principles. One, we're purely digital because that's where the growth is. Secondly, we have what we call this holy trinity model of first party data that is client owned data driving the creation of digital content, which is then pumped out programmatically, algorithmically. We get the results. We look at the data again. We adapt the content. Personalization at scale is what we call it. So when we work for Netflix on Narcos 3, we create 1.6 million different potential executions. And if we know David likes hunting and fishing, we'll serve you with a piece of content about Narcos 3 that makes it look like it was hunting or fishing, or if you like Manchester United sports, or if you what you read the Wall Street Journal or wallstreetjournal.com, you know, it compares it to a business. So it's personalization at scale. So that's the second. The third is faster, better, cheaper is the mantra we go to market as faster meaning agility, better understanding the digital ecosystem, about 20 companies, some of which I've mentioned, and cheaper meaning efficiency and value. And the fourth principle is a unitary structure. One PL, no separate PLs divided. So S4 Capital. Instead of the earnout structure, what we've done is we've said to people, it's the first sentence of every conversation, merger conversation. If you want to sell your business, don't talk to us. Talk to Accenture or wherever it happens to be. If you want to buy into our mission, which is to create the new, what we call the new age, new era advertising and marketing service model, and at the same time disintermediate, disintermediate or disrupt the old, join us. So everything we've done, you know, we started S4 from zero, acted a private company called S4 Capital, which had acquired a content company called MediaMonks. We injected that into a shell company in London in September of 2018. It was called Derriston. It was listed on the London Stock Exchange, valued at 20 million or something at that time. And today... We have 3,200 people, revenues of 500 million, a market cap of three and a half billion dollars. And, you know, our biggest client is Google. Our second biggest client is Apple. That's NDA, but we, we can't talk about it publicly. We can talk about it privately. Uh, third and fourth will be BMW Mini and Mondelez. Fifth is Facebook. 
55% of our revenues come from tech. On the packaged goods side, Procter, Nestle, Coca-Cola, Mondelez, Healthcare, Novartis, Bayer, Merck, Sanofi, Retail, WBA, and Ace Hardware. So it's, um, yeah, but the principle behind it, to your point about acquisitions, is what we're doing now is we're making everybody as much of an owner as we possibly can. And that, the fundamental point is that the modern capitalist corporation really you find ownership is separated from control. So you have managers running the company who often don't have a significant financial interest. I remember uh, Jorge Lehman at 3G, we were in a Microsoft conference and all the great and the good were there, Bezos, Munger, Buffett, and for some crazy reason, myself and Justin King, who used to run Sainsbury's at that time, we're, we're leading the session. And um, Lehman from 3G you know, so was sitting in the, the session and he didn't say anything for the hour. And I, at the end of it, I said, uh, well, hey, what, what, what do you think about this stuff about corporate governance? And this about, must have been about six or seven years ago. He said, oh, I don't really believe in that. He said, I, 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 the best corporate governance is management having a significant equity interest, preferably for, for which they have paid, or borrowed, or or mortgaged their their house and their family, etc., and then they have a vital interest. So that's the difference now. So instead of having a segmented organisation, we've we've got a unified organisation where people have a very serious. You know, forty percent of the company is owned by people inside the business. So very different concept. Now I don't know. Going back to your question whether that's more successful <laughs> than the statistics or not. But in a people business where the needs of clients have changed, I think the model has to be changed too. If there's obviously a reason you continue to be successful. You do have a way of staying ahead of the curve. <laughs> hopefully, hopefully, hopefully. So uh, I know our, our time is running tight, but there is a question that I think um, audience members will uh, find interesting to get your perspective because you're on both sides of this one. Yeah. Uh, you received an MBA from Harvard yeah. and you're associated with leading business schools in the world from the yeah. discussion we had up front. Yeah. And you've obviously been very successful. So in your opinion, what do business schools do a good job of teaching? What are they missing in their teaching when graduates confront the real world? Yeah. And what advice would you have for recent business school graduates who are likely in the audience as they do enter the real business world? Well, uh, uh, let me deal with the last one first. Be patient is what I would, I, I would say. And the reason I say that is, you know, my mother thought it was the worst thing ever that I went to Harvard Business School, you know, my two years there. Uh, <laughs> now, I went, straight, I went straight from school and I went straight from Cambridge. So, I was part of the class which Dean Athos, who was the admissions tutor, termed the, the most naive class that there ever had been at the, the Harvard Business School. The time of the draft, so a lot of people in America went straight to B school. So we had many people who didn't have experience. And, um, you know, the original bargain between HBS and McKinsey and Goldman, basically, was... You, you do your undergraduate degree, you do two years at Goldman and McKinsey, you go to Harvard Business School, you do your two years and you go back. That was the original concept. You know, I went there when I was 21 and had very little, if any, experience. And there were probably, I don't know, 20 or 30. I was the second youngest in the class 700. There was only one person who was younger than me. So we were very, basically a young and inexperienced bunch. We had a Jesuit priest uh, who was uh, David Morrissey, who was about 40. We had a USA, Bob Conlon was his name, was a USAF uh, colonel. So we had some older and wiser people in the class, but basically it was a pretty young and naive class. And I, I, I think, look, if it's a class where, where people, the average, I think, graduation age at HBS at the moment is around 27, so they go in at 25, so they would have, say, three or four years experience. They are probably more seasoned and better than I was because the problem with the B-School is that you're in a hothouse. And certainly in the case of HBS, 
for two years, you get three case studies a day, which says what should the chairman or CEO do and why? And naturally, when you come out of HBS, you think you can run the world. And the truth is that you can't. You know, there was a, I mean, to your question, David, there was a time when companies would not hire HBA, Harvard MBAs on the first job. They would hire them on the second job when they'd broken their nose <laughs> or on their first job. They went in saying, I can run the world. Um, I, I think that's the issue that, you know, I, I look at the MBA as being, I didn't do a PMD, which is a program for management development, you know, which you do in your 30s or an AMP, advanced management program, when you're doing your late, your mid 40s or late 40s, whatever it is. I, I think it should be a continuum. You know, I think it's ridiculous that we, you know, the great thing about it was you could take 18 months of your life with great people, and it was a trade difference between Cambridge in England and Cambridge in Massachusetts was Cambridge in England, I struggled with economics and it was very theoretical and the teachers didn't like to teach. The teachers at HBS were superb. They were actors. Walt Salmon, Milt Brown were, 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 were fantastic teachers because they were actors and actresses, you know, Rosabeth Cantor now and people like that. Chris Clay Crew. I mean, these people are, are superb. Um, put no in your mouth in a class unless you really, you know, milk, milk um, the, the manufacturing policy class in the, the elective in the second, which Wickham Skinner ran, was an extraordinary experience. I mean, it was, it was called manufacturing policy, but it was really about business strategy. We looked at the electronics, furniture, and there was one other industry we, look, we looked at. And it was incredible. And you didn't, you literally did not say a word unless you were fully prepared because he, he, he hauled you over the coals. Superb. Absolutely superb. So, look, uh, I, I think the answer to your question is that it, it, it's a mix of experience. Um, and, I, and I'll finish it. <laughs> Uh, there's a there's an Israeli professor. I think his name is Aziz A Z E S. I think it is Professor Aziz, and he does these YouTube videos. He's a management professor or whatever, and he's got one great video which uh, which I saw where where he identifies the difference between wisdom and intelligence, and he says older people like you and I have wisdom. <laughs> and young people have intelligence and make sure your companies are, are, are run by wise people who have intelligent people working for them. And I think, and I think that's, you know, that's the way I would put it because the reason this came up was because of ageism in our industry that a lot of old people are being fired because of COVID this year, something like 50,000 people will be fired in our industry you know, we're growing our headcount. We're up about 26% already this year in terms of like for like headcount. But I, I really think that's it. So I think probably the answer is that graduates coming out of business school are intelligent, but they aren't wise. <laughs> and it takes time to develop wisdom. So I think Professor Aziz, with his YouTube video, is right on the button. <laughs> well, I would say that's a, a very pithy way to uh, conclude that question. And um, I know our time is concluded. In fact, we ran over a little bit. Uh, I've certainly enjoyed it. And I right. certainly believe that our audience members are looking at this and saying, yeah, there's a good reason to listen to Sir Martin Sorrell. He actually seems to know what he's talking about. I hope so. Uh, I hope. Thank you for making it so much fun. No, and I, I, I loved it, David. You were great. Absolutely great. You should do this. You should be, you know, on, on CNBC doing this <laughs> every week. Yeah, David, David Rubenstein, watch out. 